Okay. Hello, students. Welcome back to my lectures on IB physics. Today, we'll be going over some past IB exam paper questions. We'll be mainly looking at paper one, multiple choice questions. These questions have been taken from the past IB exams. So here comes your first question. Which of the following is an assumption of the kinetic model of an ideal gas? Option A, the gas is at high pressure. Option B, there are weak forces of attraction between the particles in the gas. Option C, the collision between the particles are elastic. And option D, the particles or the energy of the particles is proportional to the absolute temperature. Now, as far as the kinetic model of ideal gas is concerned, you are supposed to memorize the postulates of kinetic model of an ideal gas. In this case, the answer is going to be C, the collisions between the particles are elastic because that's an assumption of kinetic model of an ideal gas. Number one, the gas is at high pressure. No, that's not an assumption. There are weak forces of attraction between the particles in the gas. In fact, when you're talking about an ideal gas, an ideal gas has zero potential energy. So there are no forces of attraction between the particles in the gas. The collision between the particles are elastic. Yes, that's an assumption of kinetic model of an ideal gas. In fact, the collisions are elastic and the momentum is conserved. So the momentum before collision is equal to the momentum after collision. And the energy of the particles is proportional to the absolute temperature. Well, the, as far as the definition of temperature is concerned, the temperature is the average kinetic energy of the particles. But here they are simply saying the energy of the particles so that's incorrect. And secondly, this is not an assumption of kinetic model of an ideal gas. In fact, as far as temperature is concerned, temperature is the average kinetic energy of the particles. And here they are saying that energy of the particles is proportional to the absolute temperature, which does make sense because energy could be potential and kinetic added together. So energy of the particle is to an extent proportional to absolute temperature, but that's not an assumption of kinetic model of an ideal gas. So option D is incorrect. So option C is the right answer. All right, let's look at the next question. If you look at the next question, you have a water wave entering a harbor, passes suddenly from deep to shallow water. In deep water, the wave has a frequency F1 and the speed V1. So here in deep water, the wave has a frequency F1 and speed V1. In shallow water, the wave has a frequency F2 and speed V2. The question is, which of the following compares the frequencies and speeds of wave between deep water and shallow water? Pause the video and try to answer. Okay, let's look at the solution. First thing you need to know is that the frequency never changes. When the wave passes from one medium to another, the frequency still remains the same. So frequency for this deep water and shallow water, in both the cases, the frequencies are going to be the same. So your options C and D are anyways eliminated. Now comes, now you have a choice between A and B. Now you see this is deep water and this is shallow water. When you're talking about shallow water, the water layers, they are pretty close together. So the shallow water is denser compared to deep water. And as per the laws of refraction, when wave enters from one medium to another, it actually bends or slows down in the denser medium. So when, you have, when we are saying that deep water is less dense than shallow water, it means that the velocity in deep water is going to be greater than the velocity in the shallow water. So your option A is the right answer. All right, let's look at the next question. You have two wave pulses move towards each other as shown in the diagram. So you have two wave pulses, they move towards each other. Which diagram shows a possible combination of the two pulses after a short time? So there are four options. Now this is a, uh, this is a question on interference, constructive and uh, destructive interference. So let's try to understand here if you look at the first part, if you look at the first part of the wave, you'll realize 
that this is too positive. Uh, so technically this is two up. So if this is two up, that means this wave has actually moved ahead. So if this is two up, that means this part of the wave must have interfered with this part of the wave. So if you look at this part interfering with this part, then this would give you minus one. And this gives you minus one here. And of course, the last part of this wave, this one has already moved ahead and it doesn't interfere with this one. So this one will be complete two units down. So two, two units down, E is the right answer. If you look at option B, C and D, you will realize that they, they don't make sense because here, if it is two units up, then let's say this wave has interfered and it has moved two units forward, that means this part of the wave should have interfered with this one. And technically, if this part of the wave, or rather this part of the wave has interfered with this part of the wave, the final result would be negative one, but here it's not negative one. So that's incorrect. So option A here is the right answer. All right, let's go over question number four. Now for question number four, they're asking you, what is the definition of electric current? Now, if you remember electric current is the rate of flow of charge. So let's try to understand our rate of flow of electric charge is already an option here. So it looks like uh, this is the right answer, but let's go over the other options as well. The, the ratio of potential difference across a component to the resistance, so it is V over R, the ratio of the potential difference over the resistance. In fact, V is equal to IR and I is V over R. So the ratio of potential difference across a component to the resistance of the component. Uh, it does follow the Ohm's law formula. So this could be a definite, this could be a mathematical formula for electric current. The power delivered by a battery per unit potential difference. Uh, that's incorrect because this is power. Power is voltage. Power is equal to voltage multiplied by current. And what they are saying is power divided by voltage would be current. So mathematically it is correct. Power is V times I. So power divided by, uh, power divided by voltage, that would be current. The rate of flow of electric charge, the energy per unit charge dissipated in a power supply. So if you look at, uh, option A, B, and in fact, D. D is the energy per unit charge. So in fact, energy per unit charge, E is V times Q. And here, if you see E is V times Q and E divided by Q is in fact V. So D, option D is completely incorrect. Option A and B, mathematically they are correct, but that's not the definition of electric current. As far as the definition of electric current is concerned, you still need to go for, go with, the rate of flow of electric charge. So the answer for question number C, question number four is C. All right, let's try to do this question now. You have two cylindrical copper wires, W1, and this is W1 and W2, are held at the same temperature. So the temperature is the same. This wire W2 is twice the length of W1 and it has half the diameter compared to W1. Now the question is, what is the ratio of the resistance of W2 over W1? So they're asking you to calculate the ratio of resistance of W2 over W1. So pause the video and try to solve it. The resistance formula is given by resistivity multiplied by length divided by the cross-sectional area. Now, in this case, if this is half the diameter, so its area is going to be pi r over two squared. So that's area is pi over four. So you see the area for the W2 is going to be pi r squared over four, because if this radius is r, if this is the diameter d, that let's say the radius is r, this is d over two. So this radius is going to be r over two. So in this case, the area is going to be pi r over two squared, which is pi r squared over four which is A over four, because here area is pi r squared, r is rho L over A, and area is pi r, pi r squared. 
So this is going to be A over four. Now let's try to calculate what is the resistance of W2. That is rho, which is the resistivity multiplied by twice L, that's the length here, divided by A over four, that gives you eight rho L over A. As far as resistance of W1 is concerned, that's rho L over A. Now they're asking you the resistance of W2 over W1. So resistance of W2 over W1 would be eight rho L divided by A, multiplied by, you flip them, that would be A over rho L, and you could cross off rho L, rho L, and A and A, and you get the answer as H. So your answer for question number five is D. Eight is the right answer. Then you have a student of mass M is in an elevator, which is accelerating downward at an acceleration A. What is the reading of the force meter? Now there is a formula. You have to watch my other videos on mechanics to understand the derivation of this formula. But the formula says that the apparent weight of the force meter is M within parenthesis G minus A when the elevator is going down with an acceleration A. M within parenthesis G minus A. When the elevator is going up, the apparent weight of the force meter is M G plus A. You can also understand the condition of weightlessness where if the elevator is going or falling down with acceleration equal to gravity, then it would be M within parenthesis G minus G, which gives you zero. And that's when the elevator, that's when the force meter shows the condition of weightlessness. So in this case, the reading of the force meter is going to be M G minus M A. So B is going to be the right answer. So let's go over the next question. That's question number seven. Your question number seven, seven says, a sample of solid copper is heated beyond its melting point. It is heated beyond its melting point and you have the graph and the graph shows the variation of temperature with time. So as you see here, the temperature is increasing. Then this is the point when uh, the change of phase starts. So you see, this is the point when the melting is happening. And this entire time, there is a change in phase. And after that, again, uh, the temperature increases. So when the temperature remains constant, there's a change in phase. Now, the question is, during which stage or stages are there or is or are there an increase in the internal energy of the copper? Now, we need to revisit the definition of internal energy. What is actually internal energy? Internal energy is equal to the potential energy plus the kinetic energy. Now, in this case here, if you look at point P or P part, the kinetic energy is increasing because the temperature is increasing. For at Q part, the temperature is not increasing. So the kinetic energy is not increasing, but the potential energy is increasing because the distance between the bonds are increasing. Again at R, the potential energy is not increasing, but the kinetic energy is increasing. So in this case, the kinetic energy is increasing. Here, the potential energy is increasing. Again, here, the kinetic energy is increasing. But internal energy is some total of potential and kinetic energy. So even though here only kinetic energy is increasing, but since internal energy is potential energy plus kinetic energy, so internal energy is increasing across P, across Q, and across R. So your answer is going to be A. All right, let's look at question number eight now. You have wave generators placed at position P, this is position P and position Q, produce water waves of wavelength four centimeters. Remember the, the wavelength is given to be four centimeters. Each generator operating alone, so these generators, they are operating alone, produces a wave oscillating with amplitude A at position R. So this is the position R. Distance PR, you have distance PR and QR are shown in the diagram below. 
both wave generators now operate together in phase. What is the amplitude of the oscillation of resulting wave at R? So they are asking you what is the amplitude of the oscillation of resulting wave at R? So first we need to find whether these waves are interfering constructively or destructively at R. Now, in order to find that, you know the condition if delta x is n lambda, where n is an integer, that's the condition of constructive interference. If delta x is n plus half lambda, that's the condition of destructive interference. So you see, again, delta x is n lambda, that's the condition of constructive interference, and delta x is n plus half lambda, that's the condition of destructive interference. Now here, delta x is, this is 20, that's the path difference. Delta x is, by the way, the path difference. So the path difference here is this, this one is 20 and this is 14. So the path difference is 20 minus 14, which is six centimeters. Now, if I divide the path difference by lambda, the wavelength, I'm going to get six over four, which is 1.5. And this is not a whole number. So this is 1.5. So this is a condition of destructive interference. Now, if this is a condition of destructive interference, that means here, the amplitude is going to be zero. So your option A is the right answer. All right. Then you have question number nine. Two polarizers having polarizing axis, x axes that make an angle of 30 degree to each other. Unpolarized light of intensity I1, you see you have unpolarized light of intensity I1 is incident on the first polarizer so that the intensity of, or the light intensity or light of intensity I2 emerges here. You see the light of intensity I2 emerges from the second polarizer as shown below. The cause of 30 degrees root three over two, what is the ratio of I1 over I2? They're asking you to calculate the ratio of I1 over I2. Now you need to revisit polarization and you know by Malice law, by using Malice law, you get the formula I is I naught cos square theta. Now here the unpolarized light is I1. So obviously the light entering here would be I1 over two. And then you can use the formula I, I2 is equal to I1 over two cos square theta and cos theta is root three over two. So you just do the calculation. So here comes my calculation. You see this light entering is I1. Half of this intensity is reduced by the first polarizer. So you, here you get I1 over, over two because the vibrations are restricted to only one plane as it passes through the first polarizer. So this is I1 over two. So here you have I2. I2 is I1 over two cos square 30 and cos 30 is root three over two. So you get three over four and technically it becomes three I1 over eight. So once you get mathematically, this one has three I1 over eight, that's I2, that's I2. So the ratio of I1 over I2 would be I1 divided by three I1 divided by eight, which becomes eight I1 over three I1, and A that is eight over three. So option four is the right answer. All right, then you have a tennis ball is dropped from top of the building. Air resistance is not negligible. So there is an air resistance acting. Which graph shows the variation with time t of the displacement s of the ball? Now, in this case, the displacement keeps on increasing. So since the displacement keeps on increasing, we need to have an increasing curve. And option A is the increasing curve. So A is the right answer. Now you have question number 11. In question number 11, you have a question on projectile motion. You have a ball is thrown from point X. So you have a ball thrown from point X and it follows a path X, Y, Z. Air resistance is negligible. 
which quantity is zero when the ball is at the highest point y of the path. So at this point, which component is zero? Now, if you look here, the options are the horizontal component of ball's acceleration, the horizontal component of the ball's acceleration. Yes, that is in fact the right answer because at any point, the horizontal component of the ball's acceleration is zero because the ball is not accelerating horizontally. Let's look at the other options, the vertical component of ball's acceleration. No, the vertical component is G. The horizontal component of the ball's velocity now at this point, in fact, the ball is traveling horizontally. The vertical component of the velocity is zero. So the horizontal component of the ball's velocity, know that there is a horizontal component here. The kinetic energy of the ball, the ball has a velocity, so it has a kinetic energy. So option A is the right answer here. Horizontal component of ball's acceleration is zero when the ball is at the highest point Y of the path. All right, then you have question number 12. And question number 12 is, is about simple harmonic motion. So you have a liquid in a U-tube. A liquid in a U-tube is given an initial displacement and allowed to oscillate. The motion of the liquid is recorded using a motion sensor, which graph shows the variation with time t of the velocity v of the liquid. So this question is about damping. Now, as damping takes place, the velocity keeps on decreasing. So option D would be the right answer. This option is incorrect because in this case, the amplitude is the same at both the points. So this is incorrect. Uh, here, the amplitude keeps on decreasing. So option D is the right answer. A and B anyways are eliminated. All right, question number 13. This question is about a reflection, wave reflection from a fixed end and from a free end. So you have a wave pulse. A wave pulse is sent, is sent along a light string, which is attached to a heavy rope. So you have a wave pulse that is being sent along a light string. So the wave pulse is sent along a right light string, which is, which is attached to a heavy rope. So this is a heavy rope. Now, heavy rope acts as a fixed end. Now, as these waves are going, you see this wave. So there, there will be a reflection, but then the reflection uh, will undergo 180 degree out of phase. So obviously this one has 180 degree out of phase. Um, so this one has 180 degree out of phase. And obviously there will be a transmission of wave. So there is a transmission and there is a reflection and the reflection is out of phase. So option D is the right answer. All right, then you have a standing wave is set up inside a narrow glass tube, which has both ends open. So this is condition of an open pipe. The first harmonic of the standing wave is 500 Hertz. So revisit the formula for first harmonic of an open pipe. That is F is V over twice L. Now the question is, what is the frequency of the sound wave if the length of the tube is halved and one end is closed? Now, if one end is closed, that's a condition of closed pipe where the frequency is given by V over four L. However, the length is doubled. So here you have V over 2L, V over 2L is 500. Now you need to find what is V over 4L multiplied by two. So V multiplied by two divided by 4L. In fact, V multiplied by two divided by 4L is again V over twice L. So it again comes back to the original 500 Hertz. So the answer should be 500 Hertz. So here comes my detailed solution. So you see F1 is V over twice L, which is 500 Hertz. That's for an open pipe. For closed pipe, the formula is V over 4L. But since the length is halved, so this becomes V over L over two because the length is halved. Uh, but, but here at the first harmonic, so this becomes, uh, 
2v over 4l because when it goes up, it becomes 2v over 4l and 2v over 4l is v over twice l. So your answer will still be 500 hertz. The answer is B. So 14, we had now, let's look at question number 15. So let's go back to question number 15 here. Here comes question number 15, and this is from projectile motion and or kinematics. So you have the horizontal component VH and the vertical component VV of a velocity of an object are shown on graph. So you have the horizontal velo component of the velocity and the vertical component of the velocity. These graphs could represent the motion of an object fired from fired from a cliff vertically upwards. No, vertically upwards is not correct. Uh, then at an angle above the horizontal, yes, this is a condition of projectile motion. And when an object is fired at an angle above the horizontal, in that case, the horizontal component of the velocity is always constant. We don't assume air resistance here. You see air resistance is negligible. So the horizontal component of the velocity is constant and the vertical component of the velocity keeps on decreasing. So you see the vertical component of the velocity keeps on decreasing, becomes zero, and then keeps on increasing in the other direction. So your answer would be the an angle above the horizontal. Question number 16. So you have now question number 16 and the question number 16 says, an object is at rest at time t equals to zero. The variation with t of the acceleration a of the object is shown from t equals to zero to t equals to 20. What is the speed of the object when t is equal to 15? So at this point, what is the speed of the object? This is an acceleration time graph and the area under the acceleration time graph gives you the velocity. And since they're asking you the speed, uh, if the velocity in one direction, uh, the speed in one direction is the velocity. So that would be equal to the speed. So uh, we find the area of this triangle. The area of this triangle is half times the base, which is 10 and height, which is five. So half times 10 times five, that becomes five times five, which is 25. So this becomes 25. And then from here till here, so this rectangle, this is five and this is five. So this becomes five times five, which is 25. So this rectangle area is 25 and this triangle area is also 25. They both add up to 50. So your answer is option B, 50 meter per second. All right, let's look at question number 17. Question number 17 says, which of the following is proportional to the net external force acting on, an, on a body? Proportional to the net external force acting on a body. So speed, velocity, rate of change of speed, rate of change of velocity. This has to be rate of change of velocity because that's acceleration because force is equal to delta p over delta t r force is equal to mass times acceleration so the net external force acting on the body is proportional to mass times acceleration so which is which is the rate of change of velocity so option d is the right answer for question number 17 option d is the right answer all right now comes question number 18 let's look at question number 18 you have a heat engine that does 300 joules of work during one cycle. In this cycle, 900 joules of energy is wasted. What is the efficiency of the engine? You see efficiency is equal to output over input. Now here, the output is 300. The output is 300 and the input would be 900 plus 300. That would be 1200. So your efficiency would be 300 divided by 1200 multiplied by 100. So it is one fourth 
of 100, which is 25%. So that is 0.25. So the answer is going to be 0.25, option A. Well, question number 19, a container holds 40 grams of argon 40, whose mass number is 40, and eight grams of helium four, whose mass number is four. How many atoms of argon over how many atoms of helium are there in the container? So let's find how many moles of argon. So this is 40 grams and mass number is 40. So it is one mole, 40 over 40. This is eight grams of helium. So eight grams of helium and the mass number is four. So this is two moles of helium. So number of atoms. So one mole has Avogadro's number of atoms. So if we find the ratio of number of moles, that would be same as the ratio of number of um, atoms. So the number of number of moles of argon. So this is one because we got one mole of argon divided by the number of moles of helium. We got two moles of helium. So one over two. And that's the answer. So option A is the right answer. So question number 18, it's option A. And let's look at question number 20 now. In fact, this is the last question. A standing wave or a standing stationary wave is set up on a string at a particular frequency zone. So just remember that the frequency of standing wave in a string is given, a, given by the formula F is V over twice L. How many nodes will be increased if the frequency is doubled, but nothing else is changed? Now, if the frequency is doubled, if you see here, there are, there are three loops, one, two, and three. And the number of nodes here are one, two, three, and four. Nodes are the points of zero disturbance. Now, if the frequency is doubled, then we will have six loops. So let's draw six loops. So here you see you have one loop, then you have two loops, three loops, four loops, five and six loops. So let's find out the nodes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So you have seven nodes. So your answer is going to be seven. Option C is going to be right answer. That's all. I hope you had fun solving these questions. Good luck for your exams and keep watching my videos and subscribe to my channel. Good luck.